All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our second Skype a Scientist Live session for the year. My name is Sarah McAnulty. I'm a squid biologist, um, and I will be moderating today's session. Uh, we are joined by uh, scientist, sea star uh, expert, uh, and biomechanics scientist. Is that what you would consider yourself? Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yes. Um, Theo Poe. Theo, thank you for taking the time uh, to talk to us and answer all of our questions today. Thank you for having me here. I'm happy to be here. Awesome. So um, I'm pretty much going to kick it right over uh, to you and you can show us some slides. And then from there, we will answer as many questions as we can possibly get through today. Um, just a disclaimer up at the up at the top here. If you find that your students today have a zillion questions and we don't get to all of them, feel free to request a scientist just for your class. That's always an option available to you. Um, if you click, uh, if you go to skypeascientist.com, click sign up. Um, you can request a scientist, whether you want to learn more about the ocean or you want to learn more about space or you want to learn more about chemistry, whatever you want. We've got literally thousands of scientists that are waiting to be matched with a classroom like yours. Um, and it's all free, just like this session today. So, uh, you know, don't hold back. Uh, we're here to connect you. Um, all right. Uh, take it away. Cool. Share my screen. All right, you should be able to see my slides. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So my name is Theodora Poe. You can go by Theo or Poe. I am a doctoral student in biology and I study sea stars. So sea stars have these appendages called tube feet, and a single animal can have up to hundreds of these tube feet. And you can think of them as like, you know, our legs that they used to move around in. So during move, during locomotion or when they walk around, these two feet generate a force on the body. And a single animal can have up to hundreds of these two feet. But these animals also don't have a brain. So we became interested in how they can actually coordinate all these two feet. Like in humans, we have, um, central nervous system, like a brain and also a peripheral nervous system to coordinate just, you know, four limbs, two legs, two arms, and um, some appendant, some fingers and toes. But the sea star has hundreds of these feet. So we were interested in how they can actually coordinate them. Um, one way that they coordinate them is during locomotion and they actually start out not being super coordinated where the feet are kind of attaching and detaching at dissimilar times, but then they transition into this type of bouncing gait. Now you can see the feet are walking um, at similar times where they're touching the ground that they're walking on at similar times. And we became interested in how they're able to do that. So we saw about in a power stroke or a step, we saw about a third of the feet are stepping at similar times. And one way that this can happen is using their very simple nervous system. So they have, they don't have a brain, they have a ring nerve and at the base of each arm, there's a ganglion. And then that ganglion is connected to this radial nerve. They have Lots of other nerves, but this is what we kind of categorize as their main nervous system because they can kind of integrate information at this ring nerve. But since there's so many feet and it's such a simple nervous system, it's conceivable that they do this using mechanical coupling, which is also known as Huygens synchronization. So here there's five um, pendulums or metronomes and they start out at random positions, but it essentially, it eventually they synchronize with each other. And that's because they're mechanically coupled, where um, if the pendulum is swinging in the same way as this platform, then that platform provides an assistive force. But if the pendulums are swinging in the opposite side of the platform, that pro platform provides a resistive force and eventually they do synchronize with each other. So. We were wondering if this type of mechanical coupling is sufficient for these feet to synchronize with each other or coordinate. And we used our mathematical model and also some kinematics in the sea star's body. Kinematics is just um, a more complicated way of saying, like looking at 
about the movement of the body in the video. And also we had a robot. So in our model, we have these two feet and they're represented by pretty uh, simple springs. So there's a linear spring and a torsion spring. Linear spring is what you see in your pens, like your ballpoint pens. And a torsion spring is something that provides a rotational force, kind of like a mechanical mouse trap. So then we have 250 of these feet and there's no central control and the feet also all start out at a random initial orientation. So similar to the metronomes that I showed you in the previous slide and they're able to synchronize with each other. So you can see that in the simulation of the model, the feet are actually stepping onto the ground and also stepping off at similar times in each step. And then of course, we had we had to test this type of relationship between the mechanics and also how coordinated these feet are. So we added some type of mechanical perturbation. We added this little weight to the C star and the C star also moves in a similar way, kind of like that bouncing behavior as a model. And <clears throat> these feet are actually synchronizing with each other during that time. So then we looked at how well the feet um, coordinate with each other when you increase that weight. And you can see that in all of our animals, that weight increases. So that is kind of the gist of the research that I've been doing. And I'm happy to like take any questions on that. Awesome, so cool. Um, so yeah, combination of uh, robots and machines and uh, animals in the lab. That's so fun. Mm -hmm. okay. So we've got lots of questions. So let's just get into it. Uh, we've got a question from Brett. Do sea stars have teeth? They don't have teeth, but they do have this. So how they eat is that they have this thing called a cardiac stomach that comes out from like the middle of their body and they digest their food outside of their body. They have their stomach wraps around the piece of food that they have and they digest it outside of their body. Sweet. That's awesome. <laughs> All right. Our next question. Um, what is okay, so back on food? What do sea stars eat? So I feed my sea stars krill and sea stars sometimes will eat algae and they really like mussels. So pretty much, you know, what, whatever they can find in the inner tidal or in the ocean floor. Very cool. Mrs. Mad Maddox's fourth grade class wants to know, can sea stars see or hear? So I don't think they can hear, but they actually have these eye spots at their ends of their arms. And those eye spots are light sensitive. So in the ocean floor, um, if they want to go towards food or shelter, they want to go towards a reef or very large rocks where a lot of plants and animals are. So they use that eye spot to sense where they can go. Cool. Uh, Grace wants to know um, if sea stars can walk out of the water too. So they these two feet are hydraulically powered, meaning that they kind of take in water from a hole in their back and they um, push that water into their feet for that sea star to move. So they technically can move outside of water. I've seen the sea star on the video walk on a beach before, but they probably can't stay there for super long because they do need that water. Cool. Um, we've got a question from Jess. I know a lot of times locomotion or movement in animals is applied to other fields. Are there any interesting inventions or innovations that you know of that are being developed as a result of studying sea stars? So the idea of sea stars being in technology, I've thought about it quite a bit. So sea star, these two feet actually have this type of behavior called collective behavior where there's evidence that these individual feet can be controlled just by themselves, like just within themselves. And the idea is that how can this collective system be applied to um, the collective system that we may have? For example, like um, controlling autonomous cars and traffic and things like that. Cool. Um, uh, we've got Mr. Karsten's class wants to know, are sea stars related to sea urchins? Sea stars are 
related to sea urchins. They're part of this bigger uh, group of animals called encanoderms, and they have this thing called radio symmetry, where you can saw in my videos that the sea stars are symmetrical, like in a circle, and sea urchins are also like that. They also have tube feet, which are these hydraulically powered appendages. Well, what does it mean to be hydraulically powered? Hydraulically powered is just something that is powered by water or a fluid. Cool. Okay. We've got a question from Staples High School in Westport, Connecticut. What advice would you give to current high school students looking to pursue a career in marine science? So I would say pay attention to what you like in your classes and your volunteering or your job and follow that into your next step because in this way you can find your passion, but you should also be practical about it. Pay attention to what job you can find in the future and that's your purpose. And try to find that intersection between the passion and future. And then I think in that way, we can all live a more fulfilled life. Um, really just follow what you like and pay attention to what's out there for you to do. That's related to what you like. Awesome. Good advice. Uh, we've got a question from Josie. What is your favorite type of sea star? I would have to say it's the ones I work with. They're, they're, common name is called chocolate chip sea star because they have these little nodules on their back. Uh, their scientific name is called proteriaster nodosis. I really like them because they can be really stiff if they want to be, but they can also mold themselves around whatever they want to mold themselves around. And I really found that the group of sea stars that I have have their own little personalities. One of them, some of them are really motivated to walk if I want them to walk, but some of them just like to sit there and I have to get, I have to get to know each and one of them during my, um, when I do science. Yeah. I think sometimes people are surprised at the extent to which our different research animals can have like little personalities, even an animal mm -hmm. star, they can have different personalities from each other too. I love that. Yeah. I didn't know and that about sea stars. They also differ from day to day. Like yeah. sometimes they're kind of tired or if they're a little hungry that they won't move as well as I want them to be. Yeah. Cool. Uh, Mrs. Smith's class wants to know, uh, do sea stars lay eggs? They don't lay eggs like birds, but they do reproduce, I believe, by putting out their gametes into the water. They do spawn in that way. So I guess it's not like they lay eggs and there's like a shell and there's a sea star inside, but they release their gametes, like their sperms and eggs in the water and then find each other that way. Lots of, lots of animals do that, do it that mm -hmm. way. Just chuck stuff out there and hope for the best. <laughs> yeah, cool. Um, let's see. Uh, do, do sea stars drink water? I don't know if they drink water just because they can take in water to power their tube feet. So they're probably very hydrated since they are submerged in the water. But I do know they eat food like krill and krill, I believe, has like water content in it. Totally. Cool. Uh, Mr. Carson's class wants to know how large can sea stars get? I think they can get pretty large. I don't know the number right off the top of my head, but there are species like sunflower stars that can have like 20 arms or something. If you look up like videos of sunflower stars, I think they can get pretty big. Pretty big. Uh, similarly, this is sort of a related question, a uh, question from Karen. How does the synchrony develop in sea stars with more than five arms? Is it similar or different when there are different numbers of arms? So I haven't studied a species with more than five arms, but I believe that they probably develop in a similar way, which is likely an emergent behavior from the individually controlled two feet. But in this most recent research I've done where I used the eye spots at the ends of each arm, and I looked at them in the dark and also in the light, and that nervous system can also um, influence the movement of these feet. So it's likely that they have almost have more of a collective behavior aspect to it since there's so many more feet, but still such a simple nervous system. So cool. Thanks. Um, Emily wants to know, how long did it take you to build the robot? Oh, I didn't really show my robot. So I, I think I can also reshare my screen if that's okay. Yeah, sure. 
So, oops, I think my keynote crashed, but okay. So here is the robot that we built where these are servo motors and servo motors, to put it simply, they're just motors that keep um, something kind of spinning. Some of the, some servo motors only go part of the circle, but my servo motors go 360 degrees and they are affixed onto an acrylic chassis and they are connected to this type of microcontroller called an Arduino. You may be familiar with those. And what we did was that we had the robot walk unweighted. And then you can see that these groups of feet are kind of synchronizing with each other, like this one, this one, and this one. And there's no central controller to tell these servo motors to, when to step and when to step off the ground they're walking on. And so the only type of synchrony that happens is due to the mechanics of the body and not any type of central control. And when we weighted them down, so this is the same experiment we did on animal with the little weights. I used a bag of rocks and now you can see now all the feet are, or all the servo motors are synchronizing with each other. And this robot, I think it took us a little while, maybe a couple of weeks of thinking about how to build it and then another three weeks to really put it together. Um, that process, I used a laser cutter and also really lots of YouTube videos and reading about electronics to make it happen. So I'll say all in all, a couple of months. Cool, that's so cool. All right, um, we had a couple people ask, um, how long do sea stars live? They can live for a while um, in captivity. I don't think they live quite as long, but I think some of them can live like decades or something like that. Some of them only live a couple of years. It depends on the species. Totally. Cool. Um, and the next question that we got from a couple of different people is how fast at like max speed can a sea star go? I'm sure it depends on the species as well. It depends on the species. I've seen that. I think mine can go the fastest, just a couple centimeters a second, pretty slow. They're, they move in very slow motion. Cool. Um, we've had, also had a bunch of people ask, how many different species of sea stars are there? I don't know if the answer to that question, but many, many. Wait, maybe into like, don't quote me on this, maybe <laughs> like into the thousands, maybe like 1500, maybe. I think I that's wrong. close to right. The, the different estimates. Yeah, okay. um, one person um, said like the different groups estimate different, like different sources um, were saying like 1,500, 1,800, 2,000. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of different types of sea stars yeah. for sure. Um, uh, what is the most, this is from Bortz, what is the most amount of legs a sea star can have? Oh, that's a good question. So let's see, my sea stars are about like this big and one arm can have up to 50 feet or 60 feet around there. And there's sea stars that are very big. So I want to say thousands of feet, maybe. I haven't counted them myself. So many. Um, yeah. We've got Mr. Salvaggio's third grade class wants to know, how do sea stars go to the bathroom and do they fart? They do actually, I've seen. <laughs> I don't know if it's necessarily the same type of farts that we have, but I have seen them release like a little bubble from their anus, <laughs> so they do fart. And I've seen some stringy thing come out of their anus, so they do poop. Not sure if they pee though. Hmm. Yes. 
a complicated physiological question. <laughs> yes. uh, yeah. How do we define a fart? It, it's a whole thing. It's a whole thing. Mm-hmm. Okay. So they let out air out of their butt. They let out air. That's pretty good. All right. Sounds good. Uh, the Shivo class wants to know, um, what do sea stars feel like? So my sea stars, when I first picked them up, they kind of relaxed and they kind of mold to my hand a bit. But if they're out of the water for a little while, they might feel a little tense. So they stiffen up with their bodies. Cool. Next question. Is there a specific type of name for a baby sea star? Like we have kittens for cats and joeys for kangaroos. I believe we just call them juvenile sea stars, though they do start out not looking like a sea star. They do start out, I believe, like larvae. Mm -hmm. So cool. Sounds good. Um, Let's see. Uh, Brian wants to know, can sea stars grow their limbs back? They can. So you can actually, it's going to sound a little brutal, but you can actually chop a sea star in different pieces. And as long as a piece of that ring nerve is there and the sea star doesn't get skin infection or something, a whole new sea star can grow. So not only can they grow their limbs back, they can regenerate a whole new star if they wanted to. Cool. We've got um, a class of, I think, fifth graders. Um they want to know what is the benefit of being star shaped like why are sea stars shaped like stars so they're so in evolution we don't they don't really go towards a specific goal for benefit but rather it's almost random things that happen and the animals that survive survive so maybe the benefit of having multiple arms is Maybe you have multiple eyes, so you can see exactly 360 degrees what's happening around you. Um, yeah. Cool. Um, here's a tough question from Emily. What do sea stars do for fun? I've seen my sea stars climb up on the tank I have. Like, I have a secondary tank inside that houses a brittle star, and they like to climb all around that. And I've seen them hang on. I give them little plastic balls to play with, and I've seen them hang on to a bigger one and spin around. Um, They like to get themselves into tight corners and also all around the tubing I have in my aquarium. So maybe almost like a jungle gym that they like to do in there. Cool. We've got a question really similar from Allie. Uh, Based on your research findings, are there any enrichment suggestions you have for chocolate chip sea stars? So you like put stuff in there for them to kind of jungle gyms for them and that's enrichment? Mm -hmm. Enrichment. Yeah, I I see that as enrichment and maybe like little decorations or little houses that they can climb into. They really like to walk around. They're pretty active in the tank. Very cool. Um, next question comes from a couple different people. Do sea stars make noise and do they talk to each other at all using other mechanisms? I don't think they make noise, but I do know that they can sense um, like chemicals in the water. So they have this thing called chemotaxis. They can orient themselves according to the chemicals that they kind of smell in the water. So perhaps if a sea star is stressed, they can release that chemical and they can kind of communicate in that way. But they, I don't think they have language like we do. Cool. Um, and uh, we've got a question. Uh, do they sting? Do they stink? Or... Sting like uh, cnidarians. Oh, they don't sting. Uh, I'm probably... I being like almost 2000 species of sea stars out there, I'm sure, I'm sure some probably can hurt you, but not the chocolate chip sea stars. They can't hurt you. Even with their nodules on their back that look a little uh, menacing, they can't really hurt you. Cool. Um, do, do, do you know how what the deepest living sea star is? I do not know um, how deep they can go, but I do know the ocean floor. So depending on where you are in the globe, I'm sure it can be pretty deep. Yeah. Um, Enzo would like to know if sea stars are able to dig in the sand. So some actually can dig in the sand. The tube feet that I showed you are very much so circular disc at the end, but some of them have more pointy disc and they can wiggle their feet and bury themselves in the sand. Much like other animals, I, I believe snakes, some snakes do that too. Cool. Um, Michaela wants to know, uh, are sea stars affected by climate change? Definitely. So 
there's this disease out there in sea stars that, called the wasting disease where it's a little sad where the sea star kind of falls into pieces and they get infected pretty easily their skin and i believe the latest research i'm not an expert on this but i believe the latest research is due to like the warming of the ocean and then that causes different types of bacteria out there to flourish that the sea stars aren't really prepared to battle again so they are affected by climate change uh, yep um thank you the next question is uh what eats sea stars what are the sea stars predators sea stars sometimes eat each other i've also so they are carnivores they can be carnivores if they're hungry enough and I've seen a picture of a seagull gulping down a sea star, so maybe seagulls. I do know crabs really find their tooth be tasty, so really all kinds of animals like to nibble on them. Delicious. Uh, very good. Um, do sea stars have bones or cartilage? They have ossicles, so not quite not quite like a femur that we have, but they do have ossicles, which is bone-like, and they their bodies can be stiff, like the chocolate chip sea stars I work with, and these ossicles are held together with this tissue called mutable collagenous tissue, and they can basically lock in a type of position that they want to be locked in and get really stiff, so yeah. Cool. Um Let's see. Uh, do 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 sea star do who do sea stars sleep? I don't think there's research on this, but I have looked at my sea stars throughout the day in the lab. They do tend to wake up whenever there's light, and then they tend to be less mobile in the dark. So I think they do have some type of circadian rhythm that isn't studied. So I don't know if they dream though. That might be a something that they don't do, but I've seen them be less mobile during nighttime. So they might sleep. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see like what is the simplest nervous system that dreams? I have no yeah. idea the answer to that question is <laughs> like what is the what is the least amount of complexity that would require dreaming? Who knows? Mm -hmm. Uh, and what constitutes to... dreaming in a sea star? As an octopus, we know that they kind of change color and we can assume that they're dreaming. Um, but in sea stars, it'd be difficult to understand that. Maybe nervous, maybe um, nervous system activity is how we do it. Yeah, very cool. Um, all right. How do sea stars clean themselves? I don't think they, oh, maybe, okay, they don't actively like take showers or anything like that, but they do have these uh, like projections on their body body called pedicellaria. Mm -hmm. um, and they kind of go like, they just kind of keep moving and maybe that's enough to clean the algae off of them since they're such slow moving animals. Cool, sounds good. Um, Mrs. Uh, Varela wants to know, is it okay to pick up a sea star? So in marine protected areas, I don't think you're supposed to touch the animals. And if you don't have um, trusted biologists around you, you probably don't want to touch any foreign animals, but maybe in an aquarium and there is a worker there letting you know that it's okay okay to touch a particular sea star yeah I think that's okay but they don't like to be out of water for too long so we should at least keep them under the water if you want to pick them up sounds good uh we've had a lot of people ask how can you tell whether a sea star is a boy or a girl do sea stars have boy and girl sea stars I actually don't know the answer to that question they don't have characteristics like humans that we can tell apart so I suppose if they they release, it would be based on the gametes they release in the water. But I'm also unsure on whether they can be they can release both gametes. So I actually don't know how to answer that question exactly. Yeah, sometimes I don't know. That's okay. Great. Um, can you keep a sea star as a pet? Yes, you can. Um, I think you can keep a sea star in a saltwater. A, saltwater tank. Um, I wouldn't keep any corals in it because sea stars do eat corals. Um, I know a lot of people use sea stars as kind of their, almost like their vacuum cleaner in their tank to eat up any dead debris, but they 
do need to be fed separately with krills and stuff. So as long as you have a salt water tank, it should be okay. Cool. We had a sea star in the lab one time that like accidentally showed up with a shipment of other stuff. Mm -hmm. And I could not believe how much that sea star ate. I mean, I was floored at how much it ate. Yeah. Think of them as being just like couch potatoes, but they ate, I mean, we just like couldn't keep up with it. We didn't know what to do. It was really challenging to keep in the lab. Um, that was maybe, I don't know if there is like hungry, if, if yours are as hungry as that one was, but it was a lot. Mine, I typically feed mine a pretty big piece of krill um, once a week. And then they can munch yeah. on that for a couple of days. Okay. Yeah, yeah. This one was way more voracious than that. It was, uh, yeah. it was wild. All right. The next question is from uh, Bridge Locust Grove, Virginia. What is the cutest, most funny thing any of your sea stars have ever done? I think the cutest thing is to see them have different personalities. Um, some of them are really motivated to move around and walk and very curious, but some of them are real couch potatoes and they just like to cling on to the glass. And I think that's probably the cutest thing. And I name all of my sea stars individually. And I think that's pretty cute too. That's very cute. Uh, the third grade class wants to know, do sea stars ever sneeze or cough? I've never seen them do that, but I guess they do f release an air bubble from their anus here and then. So maybe a fart, but I don't know if they cough. Sounds good. Um, is there a difference between a sea star and a starfish? Why are there different terms? I think the term starfish came about sooner than sea stars. And what happened probably is scientists realized that they're not actually fish, even though they live in the ocean. And then we started calling them sea stars. Cool. I know we call it, we still call cuttlefish fish when they're not mm -hmm. fish. I always wonder like which groups of scientists decide to chuck the fish word and which don't. It's always kind of right. a fascinating linguistic question. Um, all right, we've got St. Michael's classroom. Um, can you speak to the evolutionary journey of sea stars? Do we know how long they've been around um, or what any close relatives are of the sea star? So I I don't know the exact phylogenetic tree that's out there, but I do know that sea stars live have lived about 450 million years. So very, very old. They're related to the brittle star, the encanoderm, or uh, brittle star, which is also an encanoderm and also related to sea urchins. Um, Mrs. Otto's class wants to know, can sea stars fit into tiny spaces? They can. So they can contort their bodies into all different types of shapes to fit into crevices and rocks like the cardiac stomach I talked about earlier. Sometimes they have to contort themselves in a weird spot so that they can take out their cardiac stomach to digest the food that's out there. Sweet. Sounds good. Mrs. Odom's science class wants to know, what different colors can sea stars be? Different colors at my sea stars are, sometimes they're red. I have, I have one that's greenish, one that's brownish. Um, some are tan colored, some are grayish. So really all types of colors that you can see. I have not seen a blue chocolate chip sea stars though, but I do know some blue sea stars exist. Sounds good. Um, our next question, um, is there a certain temperature range that all sea stars need? Do different species have temperature ranges that each one likes? How does that all work? So some sea stars might live in colder water and they like the colder water, but my sea stars are tropical. So I typically keep them at around um, 75 Fahrenheit. That's, that's kind of what they like to be cool. in, 72 to 75. Sounds good. Um, let's see. Oh, this is a good question from Ms. Vanderpool's class uh, in South Hadley, Massachusetts. Um, are all sea stars found in like saltwater environments or do you ever get freshwater sea stars? I believe the sea stars are typically in the ocean. So just saltwater. Yeah, I don't know of any freshwater urchins or sea stars. They're very sensitive to the salinity. Um, I have to keep mine really between just 35 to 36 uh, the PPT, uh, parts per 
thousand. Thousand. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Okay. Cool. I, I, yeah. Salt water um, is easier for many animals to deal with than fresh water um, mm -hmm. because it's more similar to the salinity of our bodies. And so sometimes animals that live in fresh water, particularly in vertebrates, really struggle to maintain the right salt level of their blood and inside their bodies. And so that's why some animals just like never made it over to fresh water because it's a real like what we call like a homeostasis challenge. So like homeostasis is when your body is staying the right temperature to stay healthy, the right salinity to stay healthy, the right all sorts of like little bits and pieces of uh, like liquid level. Like you're not too dry, you're not too wet, um, complicated. Uh, and fresh water is harder for that sometimes. Um, there's another fact about sea stars that they don't have kidneys. So that's probably why they never made it to fresh water they don't have an organ to regulate that type of salinity wow. or chemicals in their body yeah cool sounds good thank a kidney today <laughs> thank kidney. all right ms archuleta's class uh how do you stay up to date with new discoveries in marine biology how do i stay up to date probably reading papers the most recent papers or um going to conferences and keeping up with what's in the sea star world or the marine world. Totally. Um, oh, I forget where this question was on the list. Um, but okay, if you were to um, cut a sea star into bits, would the bits that turn into full sea stars, would they be genetically identical to each other? Don't know exactly the answer to that question, but I'm going to hypothesize or give an educated guess that probably genetically equal because they're the same sea star that got cut up yeah i think they would have to be yeah i think so mm -hmm. too um the next question is from emily can sea stars stick to anything so that's something that i've been very interested in but i haven't explored is that their tube feet have this adhesive this reversible adhesive that's also you know able to work in marine conditions or in salt water. And I've seen them stick to glass. I've seen them stick to tables and my gloves and my skin and also even fabrics. So that's what I've seen that they can do. And I think something sh someone should really look into that to see how we can have this reversible marine adhesive. Totally. Um, next question is from Mrs. Buff's class. Uh, do sea stars remember or have memory if they don't have a brain? So no one studied that before, but I have seen some very motivated sea stars where I put them in their experimental aquarium where I you know, take videos of them and there's bright lights in there so I can um, you know, record them um, in a good way so that I can track them. And I've seen that some really motivated sea stars know what to do when I place them back in the experimental tank. I don't know how long that memory lasts, but at least within like days or weeks, I've seen some sea stars kind of know exactly what to do once cool. I place them back in. But no one studied, I think, memory in sea stars before. So that's something cool that someone could study. Maybe somebody listening right now is going to become yeah. a scientist that studies the sea star memory. Uh, very cool. Um, Mrs. Otto's class wants to know, what made you so interested in sea stars in the first place? So before I became, before I studied sea stars, I was actually going to college to become a medical professional, like a nurse. Uh, my mom's a nursing assistant, and I didn't really know exactly what else to do other than what my parents did. So then I did, I went to that and I realized in my classes, I was much more interested in physics, particularly the kinematics. And it's just a fancy word of saying like, well, how do things move? Like in physics classes, an example is, you know, how you throw, if you throw a ball at a particular speed or velocity, where will it land? I was much more interested in that aspect. So then I went into physical therapy, which is, a medical profession that includes movement. But there I realized I was much more interested in, say, how someone got hurt rather than really um, doing that physical therapy with them. So I went into research. I didn't go straight into um, animal locomotion or even sea stars. I went into this field called computational biochemistry, where mm -hmm. I studied 
um, molecules on a computer, trying to understand them through mathematical models. And I realized I was much more interested in how the proteins fold onto each other. So that's how I came into animal locomotion. And then I still hadn't reached a sea star stage yet. I was actually in a frog lab studying how they move. And um, I just started wondering how animals without brains can move fluidly, similar to how you know animals with brains like frogs can jump. Like how can a sea star without a brain move? So that's how I got into sea star. So yeah, like every step of the way, I paid attention to what I liked and what I didn't like. Perfect. Sounds good. Um, We've got a question, do, do starfish, sea stars, have hearts? I don't know if they have an organ that like pumps blood, but I do know they have a water vascular system that runs throughout their body. So then they can take in water from a little hole in their back and they, they do push water throughout their body, including the, their two feet. So they have some type of vascular system, but I don't know if it's a, heart like a pump like a heart cool all right and then we're gonna do our last audience question uh because we're almost at 45 minutes here uh this is from saint michael's uh we talked about how sea stars can regenerate their limbs how long does it take them to do that and do they use mitosis to make it happen i don't know the exact answer to that question but i do have a sea star that we got where it has a shorter limb. So I know that that limb probably got cut off at some point and it still hasn't grown back fully. And I've had that sea star for a while. And in terms of the mitosis, if they have to you know, create new cells and I assume that's probably the process that how it happens. Awesome. Thank you for answering. Uh, so many questions. I have marked 142 questions as answered. Now, a lot of those were duplicates, like lots of people asking what sea stars, but holy moly, that's a lot of questions. Uh, thank you everyone for your curiosity too. Um, at this point, I'm going to ask you the same two questions that we ask every scientist at the end of these sessions. The first question is, if you had everyone's attention in the whole world and you could ask them one, or you could tell them one thing about your area of expertise, what would it be? I, as a scientist, I think understanding basic science or really science about you know, animals or you know, even something small like bacteria, that is not directly applied to something like medicine or technology. Um, it's still important because I believe lots of innovation can come from understanding the natural world around us and you really never know what you could find. Like for example, in sea stars, they have this um, collective behavior that can happen in the tube feet, but they also have a nervous system. So how can some a central controller like their nervous system control these um, independently controlled agents? That something that I I don't think any other system I've encountered has. Like collective behavior is seen in schools of fish or shawls of birds and ants and things like that, but they don't really have a central controller. And I didn't go into studying sea stars to find out how can I control a collective system, but it's something that I stumbled or found on the way. So it's really like, I don't think we should just focus on application, but we should also focus on basic science for future innovations. Cool. Um, and then your second question is you still have everyone's attention in the whole world and you can tell them one thing about anything and it can be as like significant and important or as just like silly goose time as you want. Um, what do you tell them? I would tell them like what I said before, um, where I got to where I'm at. I didn't know where I was going when I started college. My parents um, didn't, don't do what I do. My mom didn't go to college, but really just pay attention to what you like while you're in classes or in your job and really find your passion. And because your passion is really your greatest asset. If you have a passion about something, then you will probably work on it more and enjoy it more than the other person, the other people in your field. And you can excel like that. And even if your parents don't do what you want to do, just give it a shot and ask lots of questions on the way. Awesome. Thank you so much.
And then one final question, bonus time. Is Patrick Star a good anatomical representation of a starfish, sea star? Well, the eyes would actually be at like the tips of his arms. Uh-huh. The, the Patrick Star is like the face is like a human's and they don't walk on their um, I guess tips of their arms they would be flat and then the eyes would be <laughs> on the tips of the arms so not quite but the radio symmetry is, is pretty good. Great that sounds wonderful thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today I learned so much uh, I'm sure everybody else um, in the classrooms and at home did too. Um, everybody our next session for Skype a Scientist Live is going to be uh, next month. We're going to be talking about how scientists find new medicines and how we get them from plants. That'll be on April 26th uh, at 1 p.m. Eastern, same time. And then the following month, we'll be talking about uh, bug type Pokemon and the real world insects that inspired them with uh, an entomologist, which is a bug scientist named Greg Pask. Um, other than that, again, if you had more questions than we could answer today, request a session for your class. Uh, it's free. The scientists are just sitting around waiting to talk to you. So, uh, you know, take advantage of our program. We're here for you. Um, thank you, Jasmine, for interpreting for us. We're always grateful for you being here. Um, thank you again, Theo. Theo, is there any, anything else you'd like to plug, mention, et cetera, before we sign off? No, just thank you for having me here. I had a great time. Those are really great questions you all have. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks again. All right. Bye, everybody. Thanks for coming. Bye.